It gives me a great pleasure and honor to introduce another distinguished speaker, Dr. Sousan El Mahdi, who has more than 20 years progressive leadership skills and experience in strategy, operations, and administration for the nonprofit uh, um, charitable sector. Currently working with one of the most reputable charities in the UAE as the Director General for Friends of Cancer Patients. Dr. Sousan's role is to supervise the continuing refinement and expansion of the organizational objectives, which include providing high quality services, organizing fundraising activities, developing, planning, and executing nationwide awareness programs and campaigns through collaboration with a vast network of national and international governmental and private sector organizations. Today, she will be sharing with us her lecture on the role of cancer foundations, improving breast cancer care, lessons learned. Please, Dr. Sousan. Thank you very much, Dr. Mays, for your kind introduction. It is really a true honor to be in the first and participating as a speaker in the first annual international multidisciplinary breast cancer conference in Gaza Strip for this year, 2022. I would like to extend my gratitude and thanks to the organizing committee, whoever worked on it, of course, and to my very close friend, Dr. Rula Shaheen, for this amazing initiative and wishing all the best and more to come in the future. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to speak the role of foundations, uh, civil society, whatever you want to call them, in improving breast cancer, uh, especially breast cancer care uh, in their respected country, and what are the lessons that we have learned uh, during our actually practical uh, work uh, through Friends of Cancer Patients. I will start with what is FOCP. FOCP stands for Friends of Cancer Patients, and we inspire hope uh, in the lives of our patient, family, donor, and community. It was established back in 1999, and uh, our impact in society has been significant since that time because we provide support to people. I'm not just talking to the patient community, cancer patient community, but also to the caregiver and the community, as I'm going to explain later on. I love this slide because we have uh, gone into a restructure and, and strategy update uh, last year, and we came up with a new purpose, vision, and mission. And I like to share the vision uh, with everybody I meet because I believe F FOCP new vision is not just our vision, it's everybody's vision. Anybody who's working in the medical field, anybody, anybody working in the oncology field, I believe we have the same vision, which is we all want to see a world where cancer no longer has power on our life. I think this stands for all of us. Um, and inshallah, one day we will have that uh, with amazing uh, healthcare providers, like, of course, no one attending the conference today. At Friends of Cancer Patient, we work on very distinguished three pillars. We provide access to cancer patient, which means we provide treatment, but not just treatment, moral support, ecological support uh, to the cancer patient and their family. And also the second pillar, we work on community engagement. And this is where I'm going to discuss our breast cancer initiative, uh, screening initiative in the United Arab Emirates. And of course, we have a lot of work uh, doing work uh, on advocacy, uh, especially in our on a national level we sit on the national control national cancer control committee which is under the ministry of health and we represent the voice of the patient um, and we have helped shape the cancer control policy in our country for the past now i think uh, uh, five years and we are hoping to also continue doing that because again we represent a very critical uh, segment in the community which is the patient voice now, going to the patient access, I did touch on it in the previous slide. As I mentioned, it's not just financial, although most of the patient, the cancer patient who comes to us, they are seeking the financial support, which means they are being treated in a hospital, but they don't have enough financial means to cover the treatment inside the hospital. So they come to us, we work directly with hospitals and we transfer the, the, the financial support needed to the hospital and it's fully paid and the patient can be treated in the hospital and continue the treatment journey. Uh, 
Now, it's not just the financial, but also we provide the psychological and moral support, uh, which we have uh, for the adult. We called it uh, Color My World. Uh, we provide uh, empowering um, uh, events for the women and men um, to just take them out of that mindset of oh, I'm a patient to engage them more in the in in, um, in activities that can empower them. And also Joy Card is very much very specialized, dedicated for uh, our uh, you know young cancer patients. And we go to the hospital, play with the children in the oncology ward. And we try to, you know, alleviate their anxiety, create some, you know, storytelling for them. So we have a lot of activities when it comes to the adult and the children as well. Of course, Lux of Hope is our hair donation um, uh, initiative, and it's it's one of the most. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, famous initiative, although we have not publicized it because lots of people feel that, you know, donating hair is the least that they can do. That's why we get a lot of hair and we work with um, stakeholders uh, and partners outside UAE to create the wigs and then we give them back to the cancer patient, of course, free of charge. Of course, Alhamdulillah, we are all Muslims and we find that spiritual support is very important. This is why we provide the Umrah support for patients. Just last month, there was a group of patients who went for Umrah in Mecca. And actually, this is the first time um, uh, our patient goes for Umrah after the COVID timing. So Alhamdulillah, we managed to do that again for the patient. Now, this is the area where I'm going to speak in. It's our community engagement, what we are doing for the community, what we are go doing for the healthy community in UAE. So we have focused on the early detectable cancer. Of course, the most important one is the breast cancer, definitely early detectable screening program for it. But also we, uh, we attach to it cervical cancer. I'm going to speak about it later on because, again, this is one of the early detectable. And of course, now with the new elimination strategy by the WHO, it can actually be eliminated, which is a huge step in, in, in the cancer world because for the first time we are not just treating and curing a cancer but you can also eliminate it. The other cancer that we focus on is Shenab and this is two cancer it's uh, prostate cancer and testicular cancer this is dedicated for men again early detection plays a huge role as we all know in this regard and of course we have skin cancer um, uh, under the skin health initiative again we can detect skin cancer especially in lomas uh, and skin change very early and we have the childhood cancer uh, under innovation although childhood cancer has no clear uh, early detectable protocol, but still we want to educate people about what is childhood cancer, especially that lots of the common symptoms and signs of childhood cancer can mimic uh, simple, uh, simple diseases. And of course, we have other initiative, which is the Relay for Life, which is in partnership with the American Cancer Society. Now, I believe the slide is very important because it actually kind of paved the uh, way to my next slide. We all know this. We all know that the cost of treatment, if women are diagnosed early, there is 50% cost, cost avoid, avoidance, which means if we diagnose women at early stages, especially in breast cancer, we can avoid almost half of the cost of treatment that they can pay. And of course, somebody like FOCP pay as a charity because we pay for the cost of treatment as well. So it is actually not just in the community benefit, the country benefit to have, to have women detected early. It's also for the payer uh, benefit, and that goes even for insurance company, that we have early detection because it will really uh, cut almost half 50% of uh, the treatment cost. Of course, the duration as well, it, uh, if women detected early, uh, the duration of treatment also reduces by half. And of course, we all know this, if women detected early, then the five-year survival rate is almost 98%, which means women can survive and live a healthy life after, of course, the five-year period. And of course, we tackle an important aspect of breast cancer, which is breast cancer in men, which nobody actually really uh, talk about. And we find that 
we found that actually speaking about this and we are dedicating a lot about breast cancer in men, a lot of uh, educational material, a lot of uh, workshop, a lot of courses, we found that actually there is more receptiveness in men to listen when we speak about breast cancer in men than actually when we, when we talk to them about prostate and testicular. And it's interesting because again, it goes to the other uh, part, which is the social stigma, which we all know that of course, breast men, breast cancer in women, it's a big social stigma, stigma like testicular cancer in, in men. And of course, uh, right now we are the only initiative in UAE that provides free access to uh, screening um, for breast cancer. Now, how do we do the screening, which is the important thing? Now, we initiated back in 2011, something called the Pink Caravan, al qafil al wardiya and the, the really objective of Pink Caravan was to, was to establish a woman uh, health access for screening. We are providing for women free access to screen. And uh, the uh, Pink Caravan aim is to spread awareness and early detection of breast cancer. We actually had also, when we started 12 years ago, we had other uh, objectives like uh, establishing the first registry in the UAE, which we did back in 2015 in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and after, of course, lots of advocacy. And how we did this, of course, you are looking at the horses because every year we dedicate 10 days in the year where volunteer riders, as you can see in the picture, on horseback, they go from one emirate to another, uh, really uh, advocating and asking people to come and do the screening, either men and women. Alongside this route where they are going by horseback riding, we actually have medical clinics either fixed or mobile. And this is where we get the screening done. We never do it in October, just because one of the main uh, messages that we want to push out there is that um, don't just screen in October, screen every month, do your uh, regular self-examination, do your yearly examination with a doctor, uh, the clinical, and also do your mammogram every year. And, um, you know, we want them to want to have that mindset with, with women that she can do it any time of the year. And this is why we don't do, choose October. If anything, we always do our campaign uh, as early as Jan um, February or March is each year. Now this is <laughs> this is one of the really beautiful outcome of the Pink Caravan. Uh, back in five years ago, we managed to fund to fund enough money to buy our own mobile medical uh, mammography clinic. So for the um, uh, amazing radiologist sitting in the and technologist sitting in the audience. This has uh, um, and this is a clinic on wheels. It is formally licensed as an independent clinic by the Ministry of Health in United Arab Emirates, and it has the state-of-the-art 3D uh, mammogram machine. Also, it has a 5D ultrasound machine, and it has also a small examination room that can accommodate to do Pap smear as well, uh, which we are actually starting as a phase two of this operation. For, for screening of cervical cancer, because basically you have the same target group of, of women that you're targeting. Now, what we have done so far, so for the past 12 years, we have managed to do more than 75,000 clinical breast examination. We have done more than 20,000 mammogram, almost 3,500 ultrasound. And of course, if you see, not all the 75 are women, 61,000 are, uh, are women and almost 13,000 are men. We have managed to discover 80 positive cases and we have treated them. And out of the 80, 79 were women, one case was, was a man. Um, and of course, we, have, we, we had more than uh, six, 900 almost clinic. We crossed across the Emirates. We have, you know, uh, crossed by horses almost 1,900 kilometers. Um, um, I always try to give a visual. It's like driving from Sharjah to Abu Dhabi, maybe uh, six times going and coming back driving. So that was actually throughout the 12 year, we managed to do that on horseback. Uh, and of course, we had many volunteers and riders, maybe over 800 who helped us actually reach the uh, population that we want and provide that access for screening for women. Now, in our region, and I believe this is 
to uh, in any country, we have an issue where we are diagnosing women under the age of 50. And most of what we are seeing actually in the population of the women that we, and I did mention, we actually discovered around 80 cases. All, most of the cases that we have discovered almost 43% are actually ranging by from the age of 40 to 49 which means that the decision we took 12 years ago to ignore the international guidance, which was saying the uh, only screen after the age of 50 was the right thing. Um, and again, um, it was based on what we used to see at FOCP, that the cases that used to come to us, they are young. So I, I personally saw uh, an 18-year-old breast cancer case, very rare, but, it, but I have seen it. So, and of course, now with the evidence uh, rising and the data accumulated, we are seeing that really the 40 year and above now is the school standard, which we are doing. Now, the 40 year and above is for mammogram. At below 40 year, we are offering just a clinical examination. And if there is any abnormality, uh, we are referring either to ultrasound or to MRI uh, breast according, of course, to the pathway and what's the physician and the family history of the woman. This is some demograph where uh, most of our population of women come. Of course, we have UAE national, but most of what we are seeing in the and we are actually uh, uh, screening in the mobile mammography clinic are actually non-Arab. Um, uh, we have uh, 23 Filipinos, 16% Palestinian, 11% Egyptian, et cetera, et cetera. And most of, again, uh, most of this population reflects the demography of the UAE as well, where we have 10% uh, UAE national and 90% actually non-UAE national. Of course, when, when the woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, we don't leave her. We, we transfer her to the charity arm. So she gets transferred from the medical uh, screening clinic from the pink caravan to the Friends of Cancer patient. If she doesn't have insurance, if she cannot afford the treatment, then the Friends of Cancer patient will actually take over, making sure that she gets the treatment that she needed. And that has been very beneficial because we kept a close eye on the on the cases that we have discovered. And alhamdulillah, now I think in the past five years, we are actually bringing back the survivors. Mashallah, they are survivors and they are becoming the face of the pink caravan as well. And I think that's an important, one of the most important lessons, again, that we have learned is that um, uh, bringing the survivor and making it the face of your campaign or, or making making that sur the survivor an advocate, uh, trying to get their life journey, the positive aspect, most of them after they survive, they, they are very positive about, you know, their future. And really that helps drive the screening program and make it more, um, you know, accessible because it a little bit clarifies the stigma that still women still has. This is some of the, of course, activities that we do. So we don't just do um, the screening. This is the mammogram. Um, Jamila, our um, dedicated nurse doing an awareness session. We can see lots of women. <clears throat> we can do also outdoor. Uh, we, this is a medical clinic, uh, male medical uh, screening breast cancer clinic. And of course, we teach the woman, we don't just do the clinical examination, the mammogram or the ultrasound, but also uh, we teach the woman how to do the clinical breast examination uh, monthly through a model, a, a workshop with a model te uh, a teaching uh, method. Now in 2019, we supplemented and supported the diagnosis process by genetic testing, because we, again, going back to the slide I highlighted about, um, you know, if we get the woman diagnosed early on the right treatment, you're cutting 50% cost, you're cutting 50% of the duration of treatment. But that's not just it, because right now with the modern uh, advancement in medicine, we are in the era of precision, precision medicine and in the era of personalized uh, cancer care as well. So because of that, in 2019, we started any woman who gets diagnosed with breast cancer through our clinic, we are collaborating with the treating doctor to also support in the genetic testing to make sure that the patient will be on the right medication and also to make sure that she will not get the you know, um, side effect being on the wrong medication. 
Uh, and again, this is one of the lessons that sometimes, you know, even as a civil society, uh, being a, you know, we, they call us charity or a civil society or a cancer foundation. I think we started to learn that it's not about just, you know, uh, cutting costs or making more fundraising elements in, um, in fundraising campaigns to get more money, but also it's about how to spend the money smarter, which again is, I believe the future is for the genetic and precision medicine. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening.